Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Frost is coming soon, but there's a way to extend the growing season. Today, we're going to show you how to build a small hoop house. Also, using straw bales, a few pumpkins, and some corn stalks, you can make a festive fall decoration for your yard. That's just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Joining me today is Jason Rees. Jason is a horticulturist at the West Tennessee Research and Education Center, and Stefan Leonard will be joining us later. He's a master gardener right here in Shelby County, and he'll be showing us how to build a hoop house. All right, Jason, fall is here. I know you're real good about putting up these fall displays, so can you show us how to get started? Absolutely. You know, okay. fall is one of my favorite times yes. of year. I love pumpkins, gourds, and squash. So first we're going to talk a little bit just about, about how to pick them out. So okay. when you go to the uh, farmer's market or uh, box store or the farm stand or nursery, you want to look for pumpkins that are not blemished. Now a little bit of things yes, on here is bit. okay, uh, but bring that home. Um, and I like to wash it in a, like a 5% bleach okay. solution. So just a little bit of bleach and some water gets rid of any bacteria or spores that are on it that may cause it to rot. Okay. Now if you end up with some maybe that <laughs> like look like this. this. Yeah. Uh, this is actually a sweet potato pumpkin they call it. Wow. Uh, it goes by a lot of different names. Kusha. But actually this is healed over pretty well and you can use this in the display anyway. Okay. You just turn it around back. Now you may want to look at it every week or so and okay. be sure it's not rotting and take it out. <laughs> but you can make use of these and we're going to use this in the display right. today. Okay. So, so just a little bit of prep ahead of time with cleaning. Also, some people like to spray like a clear shellac mm -hmm. on there, and sometimes you'll purchase them already that way. I don't like it because it looks fake. It gives it a okay. shiny look, but if you like that, there's nothing wrong with that, and okay. that helps uh, protect them as well. Now, do you like the long stems? I love the long okay. stems on them. <laughs> and, you know, really, you know, kids love those stems, but you really shouldn't pick it up by the stem because if Good. the stem falls yeah. off, okay. it's more likely to rot. But, you know, you can't resist a little child picking up sure. the stem, and even myself. So you'll probably see me do that today, but okay. I prefer not <laughs> I try not prefer to. Prefer not to. Okay. okay. So we're going to get started. First right. you want to start with straw bales. Um, and you know, depending on your budget, how many, but we're using three today. Um, and you know, just stack them where they're secure in the landscape. And, and uh, you know, I like a lot of times start with two on the bottom and then capping it with the top. Okay, pretty and secure. Then, right. Yeah, get it pretty secure yeah. on there. And then we're also going to add some corn stalks. Uh, Today we have the convenience of a lamp post here we're going to use, but if you don't, you can always use a wooden uh, tomato stake to tie them on to, of course, drive it in the ground with the hammer. But again, we're con very convenient today with the lamp post. We've got a big bundle of corn stalks. Yeah, we're just going to wedge it in here okay. behind the uh, straw bales. It's a good and fit. Then, oh, it works great. Yeah. And then you really should secure it with some twine, but we'll skip that step for right now. Uh, but that kind of gives you a backdrop behind the uh, straw bales. So first you want to pick out the larger pumpkins and get okay. those placed. So we'll start with this kusha or okay. sweet potato that's a little on the sad side. <laughs> so I'm just going to use it on the ground here. Now is that going to um, be okay on the ground? It'll be okay. On this concrete? If your soil is really wet, uh, you know, if this is in a mulch bed or in a lawn, you might want to put a little uh, straw down below it to okay. kind of wick the water away. And yeah, here on the concrete, this is a little rough, so it could damage it. And you'll see where I've got the pumpkins piled that I've okay. laid down some cardboard. Just the less scratching, the better. Okay. So if you want to hand me that big jack-o'-lantern yeah, there, we'll, we'll add it to the display. Big jack-o'-lantern, okay. I think I'll put it right here. A little bit of height. Okay. And then I'm going to build some height right here by uh, stacking some pumpkins together. So we're going to start with one called Cinderella. I Cinderella like is a really nice deep orange Cinderella. red. Cinderella. Cinderella, okay. isn't that fun? So I've cut the stem off Cinderella. Okay. And then we're going to add a flat white boar is the nice. name of this one. It's actually a winter squash. Again, I've cut the stem off. Now why did you cut the stem off? So I can stack, okay, stack so you can the stack two together. Okay. So um, once you cut the stem off, you, sometimes if it's, if it's kind of moist, you might want to let it dry in the sun. It'll seal over like you see here. Okay. It's, it's actually sealed over okay. and uh, will not decay. So we're putting that on top, and you kind of just have to work it around and around <laughs> till it fits properly. And then we're going to add one called Rumba. Rumba. Rumba's got a beautiful stem. <laughs> now you could stop right there, again working it around till it's in place. But I'm going to cut that stem off with my pruners and add another on top. Okay. And you could 
all different colors, shapes, sizes, but I like on top, usually a round one, kind of fun. I'll shorten that stem just a there little bit it. more. Okay. And then crown it with that guy there. It's so crowned. that gives you a little <laughs> height in the display and it's fun. So when you're picking out your pumpkins, uh, if you want flat ones to stack like this, you really got to kind of sort through the yeah. piles and, and make sure they're as flat as they can be so they can stack together. And then obviously you want to start with large on the bottom sure. and end up with small on the top. Sure. So, um, so they'll stack properly. But that gives you some extra height in the display. Okay. Then we'll continue adding some bigger it's a guys. good size. Wow. I also like to mix, wow. uh, you know, obviously different colors. So this is a snake, snake gourd for that green color. And if you want to hand me a couple big guys, there's a great big guy okay. down there. All right. Heavy. It's That's heavy. actually a it's winter squash. Uh, it's a winter squash, okay. Yeah, winter squash is called Long of Naples. <laughs> and so, you know, it could be laid down on the display. It could be propped up. And, you know, you don't expect to do this in a few minutes. You might have to play around with sure. it. Uh, if you get tired of it, go in the house, go to the grocery store, come back and fiddle with it some more. So. Um, you know, once you set it down, that doesn't mean it has to stay there. So, okay. you know, I'm really, I'll I don't care for that, around. but yeah. I'll <laughs> move it around here again in a few minutes. So, okay, you want go ahead and hand me some of the larger things. I'll get you one of these. Another okay. snake. Another snake. Lay him right there. And so this is a jack o that just hasn't turned orange yet, okay. but I really like it because, again, it's a, it's a different variety of color, so it adds a lot of dimension. Uh, to the display, so we'll like pop him right down in front of the orange. Okay, one And then how about red warty thing in the basket? Yep, I'll oh, take that. Let's take that this one. This Turk's turban. And let me just pop it here for how right about now. That? So this is red warty thing, isn't that a fun name? It's not it's exactly red, warty. but that's pretty cool. So okay. it adds a lot of texture uh, to the display as well. And once you grow it, it looks like that. Uh, I mean, this is how it grows. Yep, yep. Okay. Okay, we'll add some more green. This is a swan gourd that really didn't end up with a head. And if you'll hand me, there's another swan behind you. Okay. Yeah. And we'll just tuck it in here. And then here we have a swan gourd that actually has yeah, the head. So good. you can see where it looks like a swan. So the gourds dry out uh, where you can actually carve them. So okay. if you're going to carve a gourd for a birdhouse or a dipper, uh, you actually wait till it totally turns uh, brown and dries out. And it usually takes six to nine months. Wow. If you carve it while it's green, as it dries, it will actually crack and break. So you okay. need to wait till it's six totally Six to nine dry. months. Yeah, it's a slow I process. And you need to, if you're drying them, you need to put them in a place where there's good air circulation um, and not pile them all up in a pile because they'll tend to mold and okay. mildew if you do that. But you can still clean those up too with the bleach solution? Yes, yes okay. absolutely. And I as they're the drying, they're going to mold somewhat naturally, but you can, you can continually uh, clean them every three or four weeks if you okay. want to. With, okay with the bleach water. It's not necessary, but if okay. you want to keep it from molding. Okay, Okay. so let's bring this Turk's turban the around. Turks. And add him in front of the orange here. Okay. And then we'll just start with some of the smaller things and kind of fill in. And if you want to help, you can grab some of them yeah, and just kind of start I tucking will. them in. I kind of like these um, smaller ones. Yeah, the little guys. Yeah, the That's little Jack, uh, Jack B. Little, isn't that Jack fun? Jack B. Little, okay. Let's see here. I like Jack B. Little. Here's a red warty thing that misses its warts somehow or another. You know, we're not <laughs> all perfect. Warts. Now, what about this one, Jason? Look at that. That is one called uh, Autumn Wings. So it has, yeah, it has, has little wings. flanges on it, or sometimes called Swan Gourd. Okay. Uh, it looks a little it's bit pretty. like a swan as well. I'll put that one up there. You know, there's so many different cultivars and varieties of pumpkins, gourds, and winter squash. And a lot of them, when you plant, if you're growing them yourselves and you plant a pack of seed, you may not always get what what was in that pack. Okay. So, for instance, this guy came up with a pack of seed of something that was totally different, but there was one plant in there that just happened to be different. So we don't know what this is, but isn't okay. that fun? Well, yeah, I love that good. height that the, the white gives. Um, and look how small display. this one is. Oh yeah, that's Tennessee Dancing. Tennessee and Dancing. I will try to demonstrate. Uh, actually, let me pull this cardboard around here. Okay. So we were using the cardboard to protect the pumpkins as we move them around on this concrete. Okay. But Tennessee Dancing Gourd is a, a gourd that you can spin like a top. Oh, okay. So it's an heirloom variety. It was Pretty rediscovered cool. in Tennessee maybe 10 or 15 years ago and is now made available through mail order companies or seed companies. But yeah, it spins like a top. I bet you the kids will love that. Oh, it's a fun. Uh, also makes good, if you let it dry out, uh, Christmas ornaments on the tree. You can paint it different colors and such. Okay. So fun, fun going. Tennessee well, look, dancing. Well, look, Jason, we're running out of time. All right. So definitely appreciate you coming by and showing us this fall display. And I can't wait to get one in my yard. All right. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thank you. I get a lot of questions about lichen. Is it going to kill the tree? No, lichen will not kill the tree. Lichen is 
a fungus actually, and it lives in a symbiotic relationship with algae or a cyanobacterium, and they kind of work together. It grows on the trees. Some people say it grows on the north side of the tree, but we got it growing on the north, south, east, and west of this tree. It's really uh, spreading out on here. Uh, it's not going to kill the tree, however, it's going to usually grow on a tree that is in a weakened state. And this tree has, has a little bit of, not very much soil space. Note this water sprout that's coming up on the base down here. That's an indicator that this tree is under stress. When a tree puts out this secondary growth, it's telling itself, I need some water, I need some sunshine, I need some growth. And it pushes out otherwise dormant growth and a, a fighting chance to gain more sunlight, produce more energy for itself. But lichen, symbiotic with the algae and the cyanobacterium. All right, Stefan, so we're about to put together a hoop house. So can you tell us a little bit about the advantages of using the hoop house? Okay, a hoop house is a structure that's used to actually extend your growing season. Okay. So that way you can have more time growing, um, actually start earlier in the spring and actually extend your growing season during the fall and winter months. Okay, so it's gotta be popular because I see it around town all of the time. Are you putting in a lot of hoop houses in some of the areas around Shelby County? Absolutely, okay. uh, I typically install about six a year okay. um, for Shelby County and some of the surrounding counties uh, that touch Shelby County. Okay, well while you mention that, I mentioned in the opening that you are a master gardener right here in Shelby County, but you also work for the Shelby County School System as a farm manager. So you actually have experience in actually putting together hoop houses, right? Absolutely. I've done this for the past three years. I'm right. Shelby County Schools farm manager educator, yeah. and I operate the farm school program that we have over about 60 school gardens in the Shelby County area. 60? Yes, over yeah, 60. Some good work. All right, so you want to start you know, with the demonstration and how you Absolutely. put it together? Okay. okay. Let's grab our parts. Okay. Okay. First, we're going to start off with our PVC straps. Okay. That's actually going to hold the PVC into the raised bed. Let's start down on this inside. end. Okay. And you want to actually install this on the inside of the raised bed. It's going to hold the PVC in place and it's going to be temporary. Okay. So you can take it in and out. There it goes. You see it under there? Okay. Uh -huh. Now, how did you first know how to do this? Did somebody have to demonstrate it uh, for you as well? Um, it's trial one of those things, era. trial and error, and actually just trying to keep growing during your season. Just seeing what actually works and doesn't work okay. in the area. And you actually want to use your exterior screws so that way they won't rust if you actually want to take them back out of your raised bed. Okay. We're going to put them on both sides and we're going to do six going all the way down for each of the hoops. Okay. Which will be three hoops. So now we have the pipe straps in, what do we do next? Okay, next step we're actually going to go get our PVC pipe. Okay. You're gonna have three PVC pipes. It's gonna go one hoop here, one hoop here, and one hoop here connected. Okay. connected. And these are actually gonna be half the length of the hoop house, okay. of the raised bed. So you're gonna slide this in. There it goes. This in, and then you're gonna bend it over. Aha. Uh -huh. And slide the other end at this length. How about that? Okay. That and you're going to do that for this one as well as this one. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. And our next step is going to actually install the purling. It's going to be a PVC pipe that's going to go from this end to this end, but we're going to overlap by an inch okay. on each side. Okay. Do you need me to hold it up there? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, and what we're going to use to attach this, we're going to use U-bolts. Okay. And we have three U-bolts that we're going to slide in place to lock it in place. All right. 
And you can find these supplies just about anywhere, right? Absolutely. You know, Any hardware store, automotive stores will okay. have these supplies that you actually need. <laughs> all right, and we're just going to hand tighten these to secure this in place for all three of the joints. Do you consider this to be pretty inexpensive? It's very inexpensive. Um, most of the time, it's cheaper than actually going out and buying a kit. Right. Now, is there a difference between saying high tunnel and hoop house? No, a lot of times they're interchangeable. Okay. Um, I've heard hoop house tunnels. and high tunnel are basically the exact same okay. thing. Um, there are different types of hoop houses and high tunnels. There are the temporary hoop houses and high tunnels that you can make out of PVC pipe like these. You okay. can make them any size. But most of the ones you see around the city are actually the permanent styles. Okay. Um, they're made out of metal. Um, and they're actually the round style or the Quonset style, and they're made to last. Okay. I've seen the Quonset style a few times around Shelby County. Okay. So our next step would be? Our next step will to be PVC end caps. End so caps. that'll actually prevent the plastic from getting torn once it's placed over. Okay. If you'll do the honors of sliding this on. Uh, yeah, I, could, I think I can handle that. All right. And it doesn't have to be tight. Okay. It just has to be, be on. on there. Okay. All right. And then our next step will be to lay out the plastic that goes over because this is actually one secure hoop house. Huh. Right. Now, what type of uh, plastic? What's the okay. What mesh. you want to use is a six mil polyethylene plastic that's hmm. going to be clear that'll actually go over top of the frame. Okay. All right. And we'll just minute. roll this out. We're going to roll it out? Or? Mm hmm Okay. And you want it to actually extend to the ground. Okay. And then go to the end. Do I need to extend this down? Or? Yep. Okay. Extend it down to the ground. All right. And then we're actually going to cut a little bit more than you need. So that way you don't have to actually have to go back and buy more plastic. All right. And if you'll do the honors, you okay, will take your point. end okay. and I will take my end. And, it goes up, and we'll just down. spread this open. As you see, we have enough length to cover <laughs> up the ends on both sides. Okay. Okay, our next step is to use a plastic tubing. It's cut in a length of three inches and it's slit down the middle. So that way it can actually go around the PVC pipe and clamp onto the plastic to actually hold that in place so nothing gets torn. Okay. All right, our next step, we're going to take our clamps and place them on our plastic to hold that in place. So okay. that way, nothing will blow out. All right. Okay. I think I can handle that, too. All right. I think that works. All right. And our last step is to take the piece of wood to set on the outside. Okay edge of the plastic to hold that down so wind does not go up underneath it or anything, insects or bugs. That way, high winds, anything, snow. There are alternatives that we can actually use instead of wood. You can use some rocks or anything that's heavy to actually let play on, lay on the plastic okay. in order to actually secure it and make sure it doesn't blow away. Okay. Okay. Let me ask you this. So what do we do with the excess plastic that we have here? The excess plastic, you can actually take and bunch up and place something heavy down, okay. another piece of wood or a rock to actually hold it down in place. All right, Stefan, so interesting question, all right? How long would this extend the growing season? The growing season, you can actually start early in spring and you can actually extend your growing season until fall and into winter. Okay. Uh, most of the times you wanna plant something cold variety, but I've actually been able to plant all the way to January. Okay, so you definitely need the sunlight though, it's critical. 
Absolutely, this is actually warmed up by the sun. If you have two weeks of no sun, then the temperature inside this is gonna be the same temperature as outside. If the sun's out, it can actually go up to 15 to 40 degrees above the temperature wow. outside and extend your growing season. Okay, all right, appreciate that information. Okay, all right. It is that time of year, y'all, to be thinking about bringing in your house plants that have been outside all summer enjoying the nice warm weather. Well, now it's getting colder, and tender plants like this Diffenbachia have to be carried indoors if we want them to, to live through the winter. And what do you do before you do that? Well, you need to inspect them really well to get off any little uh, trespassing insects or even frogs. I've carried in tree frogs before, which are kind of nice, but then again, they're kind of bizarro in the house. And you also need to probably clean your pot, get all the algae off, and you need to tip it over. And a lot of times you'll have slugs and pill bugs and other little undesirable critters that will be coming in with the pot. So I'd clean my pot up real good, inspect it to make sure there's no insects or anything like that, and make sure you don't have fire ants because uh, I have actually brought in fire ants and just didn't know it. So you need to make sure that you inspect the pot for that and take measures to prevent bringing those in. All right, so here's our Q&A session. Stefan, you jump in there with us and help us out, okay? All right. All right, here's our first uh, viewer email. It says, hi, Family Plot Gang. I have a plant growing in my backyard. It grows in stalks or shoots, and it's very beautiful in the wind. I like that description. It is dark green and almost looks like dill with its feathery branches. I did not plant it, it just grew one spring. Do you have any idea what it is? And this is Miss Emma Jean in Knoxville, Tennessee. So thank you, Miss Emma. So Jason, what do we think that is? Well, after looking at the picture, it's mm -hmm. dog fennel, which okay. is a eupatorium, closely related to Joe Pieweed. And sure. it is native and probably just blew in. Uh, and in late summer, it's gonna have nice yellow, okay. small flowers that can be used for cut arrangements as well. And it's called dog fennel. I'm not sure where the dog comes in, but the fennel <laughs> part comes in because it smells a little bit like fennel. Yeah, and I've smelled it too, and I've seen it out in pastures yes, and things yep, like yep, that. Yep. So again, it probably just blew in, like you yep. said, by seed. Okay, and got spread. It is a perennial, so it'll be back next year. So it is a perennial, yes. okay. Yep, yep. How tall does it get? I oh, mean, I've seen it six, eight feet tall. So, okay. depending on your soil. Wow. So Ms. Emma G, you have a uh, real good soil, yeah. obviously, because <laughs> yeah. these things are uh, pretty large. And we thank you for the beautiful picture, well uh, taken picture, good description. So I hope that answers your question, all right? So here's our next question. And Jason, I'm glad we have you here today because you're gonna love this next all question. Right. Is it really necessary to prune crepe myrtles? Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, and why not? Well, you should plant the right crepe myrtle for okay, the right spot. Okay. So if you need a short one, you should plant a cultivar that's going to stay short. If okay. you want one that's going to get 25 feet tall, do your homework and choose that variety. Okay. Now, if you're worried about not being able to see through it, if it's a tall crepe myrtle, you can limb it up by removing the bottom branches. Okay. But there's no need to cut the top off, as we've referred to as crepe murder. Yeah, and we see that a lot around the landscape, Stefan. I'm pretty sure you've yeah, seen that absolutely. as well. Yeah, absolutely. A lot yeah. of times, crepe myrtles are planted in wrong locations. They grow so fast, then they get in the way. So people sometimes have to alter or cut down to make sure it's feasible <laughs> for their properties. Crepe murder. Uh, so very like important that. to choose. I know Jason's going to like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what is it? It's stop the chop is what you yep, always say? Yep. Stop, stop the, the chop. chop. Yep. <laughs> but you know, we live in a copycat society, so if my neighbor you know, is murdering his crepe myrtles, and guess what I'm thinking? Well, that must be the right way to do it. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, I just think that's the case that's going on now. So we just have to make sure we educate folks on uh, pruning those correctly. That's right. So pruning them properly or by removing lower limbs or suckers mm -hmm. uh, or choosing the right plant for the right place. So if you want a short crepe myrtle, you need to plant a cultivar that's gonna be short. Okay. Or if you want a tall one, you know, again, do your homework, choose the right plant. All right, do your homework, he says. And something else too, anything that's crossing we can get rid of those, yeah, right? Absolutely, cross branching where they're rubbing, you might want right. to take those out. And you know, the best time of year to prune is really late February, early okay. March to, to take out those branches. Okay. You know, a few here and there is okay. Right, but right. Major pruning, late February, early March. Okay, but you don't have to prune. That's right. Otherwise. All right, so here's our next viewer email. I have a number of pumpkin plants. One plant has light color modeling on the leaves near the veins. What is causing this? And this is Miss Adeline. So what did we think that was? Well, Jason? after looking at those photographs, that's actually the cultivar, the variety of pumpkin she happened to have. Okay. Some of them have silver in, in the leaf. Okay. Now, if it's uh, more irregular, uh, or you can rub it off with your fingers, if you kind of rub on it and it rubs off, then it's probably that, powdery yeah. mildew, and then you may want to address that with some control. 
Right, yeah, and if it is powdery mildew, of course, that means there's some crowding going on. There might be some shade conditions going on. Uh, might be too much nitrogen fertilizer, which can cause that right. as well. Uh, but you can use uh, fungicide. Uh, it's a preventative, okay? Uh, but it's copper-based fungicide. Uh, there's chlorothionyl, which is daconil that the homeowner could get. Uh, sulfur, but you have yep. to be careful when you're using sulfur, of course. But those are some means to get rid of the powdery mildew. But we're not saying this is powdery mildew. No, well, the picture we saw, yeah. it was this, the variety that it Okay. Was. Wow. And so that happens naturally. Yes, absolutely. Wow. I think that's real nice looking. Okay, Miss Adeline, hope that answers your question. Uh, the next question is about pumpkins as well, Jason. I have a high population of squash bugs and I'm wanting to harvest my pumpkins early. Is this possible? And you've grown, of course, thousands of pumpkins, I'm sure. What do well, you think? The, the pumpkin needs to be mature and, ah. uh, before you actually harvest it, if you want to keep it for a long time. So sure. if you want a long shelf life. And one way to tell if the pumpkin winter squash is mature is by pressing with your finger. Now, what they'll <laughs> tell you is take your thumbnail and press uh, something. Yeah, if good. your thumbnail goes in, it's not ready. Well, if it does, you've messed it up. Me yeah, I just, I've always wondered that. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah, so I just do it by pressing really hard okay. with my thumb. And if it, you know, is pretty firm, then I think it's ready. Um, you know, if you're going to cook with it, you harvest it a little bit early, it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, um, but if you just want to use it for like a display or something, you can harvest it at the mature green yes, stage. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Would you still clean that up with the bleach solution oh, that we Absolutely. talked about earlier? Yep, okay, yep. all right. What about the squash bugs? I mean, they're, they're a huge problem. And I'm pretty sure you saw plenty well, squash bugs. Well, you know, if you're really there. growing for quantity, you need to, to spray for the squash bug and the okay. cucumber beetle as well. Yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, there's some safe insecticides out there. You do want to be concerned about the bees. It's best to spray yes. late in the afternoon because yes. yes. the flower on a cucurbit or squash or gourd or pumpkin is closed up in the afternoon. Okay. So the insecticide won't get on the flower. Okay. So late in the day, the bee pretty much goes right to the flower the next morning when, the, when it's open. It's open. All right, Jason, Stefan, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for being here. All right, thanks for having me. Thank okay. you. Remember, we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org, and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee, 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all the time we have for today. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next time for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.